Welcome to Change the Shed. It's Wednesday. Um, <laughs> sorry, I should review this before I <laughs> before I get it. Um, Wednesday, August twelfth. Before I forget, I will be back. I will be back here next Wednesday, August nineteen. Uh, and it looks like you all are. Um, I'm looking at my iPad. All jumping in from all over the place, California and Texas and Vermont. Welcome everybody, Brooklyn. Forget I live back. North I Carolina. Back Wednesday, August 19th. Oh yeah, I forget I have to turn the volume off on my other device. Um, hot in the UK, Vancouver, New York, uh, Maine. It's not going to be quite as hot here today. I hope. Um, it has been super hot in Colorado for. Um, for a while, let's see, I'm now hearing, I'm getting your little beeps. Okay, hopefully you can still hear me and you don't hear those beeps. Um, great, welcome everybody. Um, I'm working on, oh, I have show and tell. Here, let me change to the bigger thing just for a second. Um, oh, wait, maybe not, maybe this is better. Um, Okay, I finished. This is a little piece from Backpacking. If you've seen my blog, this is hand spun. Um, one of my summer 2020 pieces, and it's a lot of fun. I really like doing this. I did the little braid on it, um, which turned out really cute. So I like the braid. Um, and then if you saw my blog recently, I don't think I ever posted a picture of this. This is the um, finished piece from the last backpacking trip I took, and I did this little guy. Um, it was about a flower and I wrote about that, but I didn't finish it. The top part was about um, snow fields. Um, obviously in Colorado, there's a lot of snow up high and it doesn't um, always melt. So um, that was what that part was. This is just a little tapestry diary piece. And um, this little, this was fun. I'd never woven with this part before. That is actually, um, Let's see if I can put that right there. That is something I got from Mirex. If you've ever looked at their website, um, Claudia Chase likes to dye this stuff. This is silk ribbon and she hand dyes it. And it's actually really pretty uh, when woven. This is a wider one. That one I did with uh, this size ribbon. So it's a little bit narrower. Um, I just loved the variegated colors there. I'm not sure that it came out great in terms of um, value. I think the background was very distracting from the flower and probably in a large piece I wouldn't have chose that. But um, I loved weaving with the silk. It was really fun. So you're looking for a challenge for a small piece. I don't know that you could get that in large enough amounts to use on a big piece, but you could make your own. So um, I hope you all are well. It's been a couple weeks. Um, uh, yeah, Gail's in Lafayette. Yeah, there's a bunch of any of you in um, Western Colorado. I am so sorry. I have spent a lot of time living in the West and there are big fires out West um, in Colorado, Grand Junction area. And there's, I think, still a big one along I-70. They've actually got I-70 closed. So um, we don't have any smoke here, just some haze, but um, it's hard living with smoke. Those of you who live in the West know that it can go on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and it's, it's really tough. Not to mention, of course, the fire. Anyway, I hope you're well. And um, I pulled out this little tiny piece today. Let's see, I'm going to move this down. Um, so I've been cleaning my studio and this piece is on a loom. I'm going to, let's see, if I back this up, I want you to be able to see the, what's happening here. Um, this particular loom is a Mirax, obviously. It's a 12 inch little guy. And you might recognize if you've taken the fringe list class that this particular um, piece shows up as a demo in the fringe list class. I think I was using it this loom might have been part of the warping demo. Well, I never finished it. It's been sitting in the corner of my studio and I am 
determined to make my studio more usable. My studio is quite small compared to what I had before in Santa Fe and I've been very frustrated with that. So I'm trying to um, clean things up and that includes finishing pieces. So this little guy is a four salvage fringeless class. Here's where the warp is. Um, four salvage um, fringeless piece. And that's been confusing to people, I think. What, um, not all four salvage techniques are the same. So four salvage just means that you take the piece off the loom and all four edges are finished when it comes off the loom. It's a um, particular technique that lots of different traditions use. I've had people really object vocally about that's a Navajo tradition and you shouldn't be teaching it. And um, I'm just going to push back on that and say that for salvage has been used all over the world forever and ever. So the Navajo do use for salvage all the time, but it I don't believe it is um, a quote Navajo technique. So I will push back on you if you tell me that I shouldn't be teaching for salvage because it's a Navajo technique because it isn't. Um, anyway, I lost my rabbit. This was a four salvage piece from that course. Oh, the fringeless method that um, I teach in that course with Sarah Sweat, Sarah Sweat actually does almost all of the teaching, gives you a shed the whole way, which is why it's marvelous, compared to other techniques where there is no shed and when you get to the top of the loom, there's no, you're weaving with a needle because you've lost all the, lost all your shed. Anyway, sounds like everybody's doing great. Um, awesome. People remember to come back even when I'm gone for a couple weeks. So thanks, you guys. <laughs> Sometimes I think, oh, I'm going to be talking to myself today. But it's never true. So, oh, let me show you the um, cartoon. Let me zoom back in. I fortunately kept the cartoon because that would be fun. Um, this this particular loom, I actually kept the yarn all together um, in a little box with the cartoon so I knew what it was. Amazing that I was that organized for two years. This was started two years ago. Um, I had to look up in my little diary what it was about. Uh, apparently, I had some idea of weaving a bunch of words and there would be like this in the middle, which just says B and then um, a bunch of other tapestries around it that were in other words. I think I was thinking of like a word cloud or something. Anyway, that idea has long gone away, but I do want to finish this little tapestry. Super simple. Um, I'm doing, these two letters are uh, backwards and in kind of shadow, but I'm only doing the shadow by mixing the pink with this purple. So it's fairly simple weaving, which is, um, a relief at times. The advantage of setting up fringeless on a Mirax is that you can use the shedding device, which can be nice. I, I do like picking the shed. I use pipe looms a lot for four salvage stuff. And I think it's calming to pick the shed, but this particular one on a Mirax is working out well. Let's see, is that working? And if I zoom in more, will you be able to see better? Holler if. I'm not showing you what you need to see. I try to keep my face and hands out of the way, but um, I still haven't been to the optometrist. I need new glasses and I actually have trouble seeing um, this 12 EPI weaving. Twelve inch per inch for salvage warp. I wish I could remember why I decided to make the E this part backwards but I didn't write it down in my little journal. I do this um, little, um, this is my current, uh, hold on this way, my current um, 
just little journal for small tapestry diary pieces. And I wrote down the idea about the words, but I didn't write down why I decided to flip the words over. Whatever. If it ends up in a show someday, I'll have made up some reason why I did that. So watch for that. This one warp is misbehaving. Probably because, oh, yep, my heddle broke. So that one I'll have to fix. Um, because the for salvage, um, technique on a Mirax, the way I have warped it, just using the Mirax as a pipe loom, the face of the tapestry is set back into the bottom bar, which means that the regular length heddles don't work. And I needed slightly longer ones, so I made heddles, but clearly one of them has decided to come unknotted. I can't blame it after two years of waiting for me to finish weaving. At the moment I'll just watch that thread, but um, when I'm not live I will retie it. I wonder if I can get even closer. Nope. Um, did I use a particular alphabet style for that? No, but that's not a bad idea. There are certainly people who would like choose a font I'm pretty sure I just draw, given this scribble, um, I'm pretty sure I just drew it like a block letter, whatever, but um, text is fascinating and gosh, it would be um, fun to play with text in terms of different fonts. There's that warp that's, um, that the heddle is no longer connected, All right? there, so I just have to pick it. That's a good thought, Nan. Um, I could make this reversible. It probably will be reversible. I can't. Oh, no, it won't be reversible because I remember I was working on this yesterday. Because I'm doing this gradation, I use jump overs. I could have made it reversible, but I didn't. I used jump overs on the back where I switched the colors. Well, that would have been smart, Nan. <laughs> to uh, make it reversible, that would be kind of cool. All right, if I do this idea again. I was playing with an idea yesterday about um, using a word in a big piece um, that was a palindrome. And I was thinking, oh, when I turn it around, then it will say the same thing both sides. But that's only true of certain letters, like the E's, even if it's a palindrome that, you know, palindrome is the same forward and backward, like the word level, L-E-V-E-L. -E -E if you flip it around, it's still L-E-V-E-L. -E -E but um, the E's would, would be backwards on the back. But... Regina, good question, is asking, is the purpose of fringe list to have no finishing work to do? Um, yes, that is part of it. Um, I'm going to see, I'm going to turn the, see if I can get that camera to stop doing that. Okay, hopefully that'll work. Um, the purpose of fringe list, um, it's really Thanks. wonderful to take, especially, um, well, any size piece take a piece off the loom and it's, um, it doesn't have a hem, but a well hemmed piece does have the same, basically the same effect. Of course, a hem at the bottom is um, heavier 
it's different. The fabric is different. So, you know, if you're interested, try it. Um, can one set up a fringeless weave on the Merrix as a way to be able to use the standard heddles? Um, Regina also asked that. Um, I have not done this, but I believe that since we did the fringeless class, Merrix came out with the Shasta combs. Um, the problem with the combs is that the, you know, they're eight ends per inch, so you have to sort of fudge things. But I have had people do fringeless warps by putting the combs on because that brings the warp to the front and then you can use the um, heddles with it. So um, I haven't done that. I don't know what the pitfalls are, but I have had several students say that they did it and it worked. You might have to get creative in your warping in terms of the um, way that the combs are at a specific set. But it's not a big deal to make a new set of heddles. Unless you don't tie the knots well enough and they come undone. I used, um, I'm not going to move the camera, but I used uh, cot like tatting cotton and I didn't tie my knots strongly enough. Yeah, Summer says my warp is tight. This is a tight warp. Um, there's a piece, if you've seen the fringeless class, there's a, a video in there where Sarah and I are both weaving. <laughs> it's a funny video. We're both weaving on the same warp, like one from the back and one from the front. And um, I sit down at this loom that um, Sarah had warped. This is Sarah Sweat. And... Um, I immediately said, oh my God, Sarah, your warp is so tight. I had no, I thought my warps were tight. Her warps were um, incredibly tight. I don't always have super tight warps. It depends. It depends on the loom and it depends on what I'm doing. In a case like this, I feel like the tight warps are helping me keep, so there's some longer slits here. And the tighter warps really help me manage that, like keep them nice and even. Um, at least in my head, that's true. In reality, I don't know. There are actually people who weave on really loose warps. If you've ever had a class from Joan Baxter and felt her warps, you'll be like, whoa. It's floppy, floppy warps. She likes it that way, and obviously her results are incredible so oh yeah Michelle you should weave your niece's name she said her niece is a name is a palindrome and if she writes the letters um in all capitals, they are completely reversible. A-V-I-V-A, that's cool. That sounds like an idea for a tapestry or something. Okay, there's my dropped warp. Oh, that's a good idea, Barbara. If you use extra wood blocks, so that would be a way to um, sort of, I assume you do that after you put the warp on. She's saying to use wood blocks to bring the warp forward on the Mirax for the for salvage. Um, you'd have to do it after you warp the loom. Have you tried that, Barbara? I feel like it will totally mess up the fringeless warp, like all the loops will be wrong, like it will make them all uneven. Um, but I could be wrong, it could totally work. Oh, the shedding device at the back of the Mirax. There's no reason why you couldn't put the shedding device on the back, that's interesting. Cool, Mary Lou. Um, one more warp here. Uh, Nan asked what warp I'm using. This is all a oh, warp. <laughs> I went right to weft. 
This is all a Weaver's Bazaar um, weft, and the warp is 26 cotton seam twine at 12 inch per inch. Um, and it's doubled when you do, you can see it here, when you do a four salvage in this way, it's doubled. In other four salvage techniques, the warp wouldn't be doubled. So 26, it's the thinnest cotton seam twine. And it works pretty well here at 12. I'm not sure I would use this for anything, any narrower for salvage warps, being that it's doubled. I'm sure this isn't the most fascinating weaving to watch. I could be building this up in shapes, but um, This is, um, so far these forms are fairly simple, so I'm just um, weaving them all the way across. Oops, there's the wrong shad, right? Some of you have noticed if you're um, newer to tapestry that on Amerix it's really easy to get in the wrong shed. Um, if you use a pipe loom, you have an open shed and a closed shed, and so it's easier to remember um, which shed you're in. It's yeah, um, because one shed is always open and they're not the same. On the Amerix, they're identical. And so um, it's just whether the handle is up or down. And so it's really easy to shift the shed twice. And if you've ever been in a class and had me say, hey, you have a double shot right there, it's usually because you shift the shed, you shifted the shed twice and put in another piece of yarn and not realize that they both of the yarns were in the same shed. I'm pretty sure I made up the term double shot, but if anyone has heard it somewhere else, I'd love to know. It might be that my teacher, James, used that term. It's possible. James Kohler. Okay, let's see. There's a little piece to this E. Let's see if this is in. Oh no, that's a straight line, okay. So right here, this E comes over a little bit, which I do wanna do, so I'm gonna bring that, this little pink guy over one warp right there. I hope that you all are weaving something. So I started this part with two butterflies of this color on purpose because I knew when I got to this um, hole right here I was going to need to split the butterflies on each side. Also if I put two butterflies here and one of the pink and one butterfly over here that meant that I was adding four butterflies and my shedding stayed the same. I didn't have to shift the shed. So right here I'm going to weave the cradle for that little circle. That little um, thing in the middle, and then I will fill that in with pink. I don't know why I chose pink. I'm not a big pink person, but I guess I think this color I really like. And so then this is the same colorway. And here we are two years later. Maybe that's why I didn't finish it, because it was pink. Not really anti-pink, I just... Okay, so to make a little circle, I'm going to bring that over. I think I'm gonna leave that one warp right there empty. We'll see, that might be a bad decision. I'm just gonna build up this center part for a minute. I 
Oh, nope, I don't want to do that. I want to move that one over. I don't know if you can really see that here. This will not be a perfect circle. Just stating that up front. <laughs> so I don't feel bad when it's not a perfect circle. If you're in my online classes, you know, I'm not fond of circles. However, I am going to add a circle module to the Warp and Weft class because enough people are interested. Okay, so this circle is going to be one, two, three, four, five. That's nice because that's an even number. I put two there. There's one sequence there, two right there. And then I'm going to make the sides straight. The secret of circles is straight bottoms and tops. So probably leaving that one warp on the bottom is not going to make the best circle. We'll find out. Another trick you can do with four salvage because these warps are doubled is um, split them to make a more smooth circle. Sarah actually demonstrates that, I think, in the fringeless class. I definitely learned that from her about modifying shapes on a four salvage warp like this with the doubled warps to um, uh, to modify the shape. Yeah, I'm not going to like that um, little hole there at the bottom. So instead of taking it out, oh, and of course my question is what color? <laughs> is this really? Um, some of these pinks were so close I had trouble telling, but I think this is two of these. Uh, Dorothy, that's a great question. She says, can another kind of line um, Let's see, can another kind of line be used instead of the fishing line? What characteristics does another line need that um, it would need to bend, not loop like regular fish line? So this is not, she's asking about the supplemental warp. It is not fishing line. It is not cl even close to fishing line. Fishing line is like a plat. Well, I'm not a fisherman, so I don't really know, but fishing line is sort of a, to me, it's more of a like stiffer plastic. This, what we're using is fly line backing. It's for fly fishermen. And um, this is a woven line. So that's why it works so well for the supplemental warp is because it's woven, it's not twisted. So you can use, just use the same warp, Dorothy, for your supplemental warp. If you're using 26 cotton seine twine here, just use it for your supplemental warps also. Sarah likes to use fly line backing because it's really tough and you can reuse it over and over and over again, but you can just use regular warp and um, it will get all twisty when you take it off, but then you just throw it away and use some more. Um, the advantage of the fly line backing is that it is very strong and you can use it over and over again. And because it's woven, it doesn't get all twisted up like a regular structured um, thread does. I hope that helps. I would just use warp if you don't like the fly line backing. Don't use fishing line because that's not going to work at all, I don't think. Um, we talk about materials, all of that in the four salvage class. Ah, um, oh, thanks, Kit. She finished her first six by six inch tapestry. Yay! Um, now she's untangling 10 grams of color singles. Hey, I found a skein of color singles. <laughs> I could send you if you want it. Um, I have a, a skein winder, and so occasionally, um, if I'm not watching the skein winder, I'm making a skein to dye, one of the uh, wefts gets pulled into the next bundle, and they get wound together, and I don't have the patience to unwind that stuff. Um, anyway, I found it while I was cleaning the other day. Okay, so I'm going to use, so I'm... Um, 
trying to smooth out that bottom. Actually, it looks like because this is a mix of the two colors, my little leaving that open warp at the bottom probably isn't really going to show up, which is good. Um, I'm going to put that to the back. Sarah would have pulled that all the way in. I'm actually just going to pick these. If my eyes were better, I wouldn't need the shed stick. Oh, COVID, you and my optometry appointment are clashing. Um, yeah, circles are hard in terms of getting them to be. I need to build up the center a little bit to get them to be round instead of oval. If your circles are oval, it's probably because you are putting you're not making the sides long enough. It's very common that we think that the it needs to come in before it really does. And um, if you make the sides longer, it will become more of a circle. Basically, a circle in tapestry is a square with four corners cut off. So if you think about it like that, it'll be a little easier to make it look round. In this case, this, well, I guess I'll see whether it ends up round or not. Um, the cartoon is actually fairly round. Uh, Jessica asked what I used to mark the warp. Um, this Sharpie Industrial, super permanent ink. The industrial variety. I've had to order them online. I haven't been able to find them at office supply stores. Um, <laughs> you guys are funny. Sorry, I'm giggling at your conversation. Um, okay, I'm trying to get this circle woven before we sign off so that you can actually see me. So here's the, I think it was Laura who was saying her circles are always not round. Um, this is hard to see. It's probably not a good example just because the, oh, I can see it better in the camera than I can. I should weave by looking in the computer screen. I can actually see it better. So what I'm saying is that these um, verticals need to be higher than you think to make the circle round. Because remember, tapestry also packs in some, depending on your weaving style. But I actually, right now, I really want to make that circle come in. And I'm going to, I'm actually going to do one more pick at least on this side. Okay. Circles are not my favorite thing. I am working with James Kohler. So I was his apprentice for several years, two and a half years or something in Santa Fe. And um, he, if you've ever seen his pieces called wheel maker, they have um, like 40 inch wide uh, circles in them, in their concentric circles. He had several, maybe four wheel maker pieces. And I asked him about it once. I'm like, why are you weaving perfect circles? It's so unlike you. And he said, well, I have a whole series of pieces that he want, that he wove then like amorphous forms, which he did do a lot of those. I think they're called ensnared light. And um, he said, I have to prove to everyone that I can weave perfect circles before <laughs> I go to weaving. Um, circles that are not circles. Um, so whatever, that worked for him. Okay, so there's my little circle. I um, will sometimes put a little point, like I wrap that center warp at the top because um, it's all going to pack down and it's not going to look like a little point when it's done. Yeah, Kit, do you often need to build up the middle of the round shape? So I probably didn't show that very well, but I did the outline and I went back and to side to side a little bit, and then I built an extra couple of passes in the middle. Um, it looks like right here, this could have been a more smooth transition, but whatevs. So 
Because this color is so mottled, I'm just gonna put that to the back. I might often actually put um, an eccentric weft over the top. Well, let's see what if our shed is going to work out and then we'll know if I should do that. Tips, weaving tips. Oh, the shed is correct as is. Um, so I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, the shed is fine as is, so I'm not gonna put, um, I could have used an eccentric weft if that was in the wrong shed to shift the shed to the other one, as well as to smooth it out. Oh good, Marla said she did find um, industrial Sharpies at Staples. The reason you want the industrial ones is that the Sharpie has apparently changed their formula in, it's not actually recent um, that they did this. Oh, I could be wrong here. I think my sheds are different. Oh no, they're not. Wow, I really need to go to the optometrist. Um, the industrial Sharpies are um, rated for 500 degrees of heat and they're supposed to be water fast, which is my main concern is that they be water fast. Um, so the regular Sharpies, which I have a million of them, but I don't see one right here. The ones that aren't marked industrial, um, they don't guarantee anymore not to um, bleed. And gosh golly, you don't want, especially on a light tapestry that has um, thin weft, you don't want your, um, <sighs> you don't want um, the marker to bleed. I really can't do two things at once, you may have noticed. I'm just gonna do a little, over the top. I realize I've gone over time again. My little monitor isn't here today to tell me it's time to wrap it up. Also, I've had a lot of fun weaving on this. I think it's partly because um, all the uncertainty with COVID and everything just sometimes feels pretty weighty and this piece feels really easy. <laughs> so that makes it fun. Okay, so That'll give me a little eccentric weaving over the top. And now I will go in and fill all of that in. Um, just like that. So, um, so right, Michelle, permanent markers apparently are not permanent. Um, I steam my tapestries heavily and my steamer is very hot and so that's also very wet and so um when sharpie said that they didn't guarantee their other sharpies anymore i definitely went to the industrial ones the um writing on the industrial ones is red and it says industrial right there um i just don't want to have i use fairly thick wefts i'm usually weaving a big piece at eight ends per inch and so I actually think if it bled a little bit, you wouldn't see it on the front of the tapestry. But if you had a white tapestry or something in a light color and the weft was really thin, you could completely ruin it. So I'd say that I would trust what Sharpie says or go to some other kind of permanent ink if you want to ink on your work um, and test it first. Brenda, this is a Mirax, M-I-R-R-I-X. Um, <laughs> Christine loves it when I lose the rabbit. That happens all the time. Um, so sorry about that, you all. So the industrial ones don't come in super fine, as far as I know. Um, but there may be other kinds of permanent ink that you could use. I haven't really researched that. But there's got to be other kinds of, um, I mean, there's a million art supplies in the world, right? So there has to be someone who makes a water fast, temperature resistant, permanent marker that would work. Um, I would research it and then I would test for sure, like uh, take a white piece of fabric, scribble on it, soak it in water, watch what happens, you know, run it through some tests before you decide to use it on a tapestry. 
Um, uh, Jessica I asked what kind of a steamer I have. I have a Jiffy steamer. This is what James Kohler, my teacher, used, and I actually like it a lot. It's a wonderful piece of equipment, but it's big. It has a great big base and then a big wand. So the steamer for a tapestry um, needs to have a wand on it. It can't be one of those ones that has the bag attached to the steamer part because you can't turn those sideways. So it has to be something that can be used on a flat table. There are some fairly inexpensive steamers, like um, one of my colleagues uses one she got for $40 at Costco, and it works great. So you don't have to get, I think my steamer was like $150. You don't have to get a really expensive one. Um, <laughs> great, Ruth. Just finished a text tapestry. We'd Gosh, we'd love to see that. Show that in the class you're in, Ruth. It'd be fun to see it. So thanks you all for showing up. I, I think there were over a hundred of you, so that's fabulous. I will be here next week, Wednesday, the 19th, I believe is what it is. Um, maybe I'll have this piece done. I'm still working. This loom has not warped yet. I have, I'm gonna write a blog post about that today. So I'll tell you about um, my dilemmas with designing a big piece. And I'll be here next week. So have a really great week sorry i took more of your time than you had this morning but have a good week and keep weaving and um this hashtag right above my head um if you use instagram use that on instagram and i will remember to go and check for change the shed i'd love to see what you all are weaving and everybody else can do that too um i don't think you have to have an instagram account to do that if you just go to instagram.com and in the search bar put hashtag change the shed, you should be able to see everybody's um, things that are labeled change the shed. And I've noticed that other weavers have started using the hashtag, so there's gonna be other stuff in there besides tapestries, but that's okay. Um, awesome, thanks you guys, have a great week. I will see you next Wednesday, same time, same place. Bye-bye. <laughs>